What's up, everybody, and welcome to a summer school edition. I just coined that phrase the last time when I totally screwed up the take uh-huh. of the Falcons Final Whistle podcast recorded in the Ticketmaster Studios. I'm Scott Bear. That's Troy McElhaney. Yeah. I will let some people behind the curtain and say that this uh, I've had two iced teas now, and this is my <laughs> this is our third podcast in a row. Yeah. It may be a little loopy. <laughs> just throwing it out there right now. But Anyways, you know what? It's all good because we're going to talk about the defense. That's right. And what we're going to do the same format that we did with the offense, where we go over three things that we learned and we feel comfortable and confident saying about this defense, and then afterward we're going to address three questions that we need answered over the summer and the fall Mm -hmm. about this particular unit. Uh, Go back and watch the offense one. It was fun. Uh, Really enjoyed it. Now let's get into this defense, Tori, which looks a little different than it has before. Very different. Comes with uh, some different expectations too. So, Mm -hmm. and again, just like with the the, the offensive one, you phrased it so so perfectly about the thing that we know Mm -hmm. about this defense. Yeah, the thing we know about this defense is that Grady Jarrett finally – finally has some help and I I think if you're Grady Jarrett you are as excited to go into this year as any year in the last few years if, if you're being honest and that's nothing against the guys that were on this team before nothing at all against them but the caliber of player that the Falcons specifically went out and got on the defensive front specifically to go along with Grady Jarrett I mean I, I just think you have if you're Grady Jarrett you're just so excited and we've talked to him throughout OTAs and mini camp, all, all that kind of stuff, and he he does, uh, he does seem excited. You mm-hmm. talked to him about Clayus Campbell and the fact that Clayus Campbell is a guy that chose to come to Atlanta. That means something for Grady Jarrett and and what he's done here and and what he wants to continue to do here. Bud Dupree is came in. David Onyemata, and something that was something that really stood out when Arthur Smith's talking about this defensive front, and he's talking about how well Grady Jarrett and David Onyemata already, without the pads on, without like going 110%, how well those two guys work together because of their style of play. And then you throw in Ryan Nielsen, who is a defensive front guy through and through. And I, I just think that this position that Grady Jarrett is in, and I know that we talked about this when we did a podcast with uh, John Abraham not too long ago, he, we're talking about this clip when the Falcons played Detroit a couple of years ago where Grady is triple teamed, and he goes, man, y'all don't have to block anybody else. You cannot do that now in 2023. You just can't because you're leaving David Onyemata unblocked, Bud Dupree, Calais Campbell, Lorenzo Carter. I mean, that, that to me I think is just so – it's just such a – breath of fresh air that for we have for Grady Jarrett. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think so. And they can come in waves, which is what you want from a defensive line. We're talking about the front line guys, Yeah, but Taquan Graham oh, is, yeah. is back from injury. Uh, you know, Timmy Horn is growing within it, you know, uh, Eddie Goldman is a nose tackle and massive. They, they, they have some depth to bring in waves. I think that's also important. You talk about, okay, you can't triple team Grady anymore. If you're an offensive line coach, you're going to have to pick your poison on who to double team too, yeah. which means somebody's going to go head to head with a guard or maybe a center or however they scheme it up. But I think that that's going to create nat- natural opportunities. We've talked for the last couple of years, the Falcons have not done enough to – sack the quarterback getting pressure is important great but your game-changing plays are when the quarterback goes down he drops the ball something dramatic happens on a like or forces an errant pass that gets picked and to have that around Grady Jarrett is important something that I'm stealing from you and so Tori talked to to David Onyemata during Mm-hmm. mini camp such a great quote that you got from him mm-hmm. talking about all these additions yeah. right but david made a point of saying that this is still grady's group Love and it. that is i mean you look at this defense in general and i i actually use this i was talking to lorenzo carter as well and we kind of started talking about this is the house that grady built oh that's really good and like i was just sitting there like oh that's that's so well put like it really is this idea that grady jarrett has been the guy here in atlanta what he's built for himself just as a a a defensive tackle in the league as one of the best in the league i mean and, and 
to me, when you see a guy who has been here, who has put in the work that Grady Jarrett did, and I, I was actually telling my dad this not too long ago. I'm like, you know, everybody talks about like OTAs are voluntary and then you get to mini camp. Grady Jarrett has been in this league for a long time. Mm -hmm. He showed up to every single OTA practice, mini camp or voluntary or whatever. He was here day in, day out. And I take notice of stuff like that because he's a veteran. Like, he really doesn't have to if he don't want to. He doesn't have to be at any of them didn't except the minicamp. Yeah. Literally didn't have to. But he's there and he shows up. And I think, like, in just in terms of that respect, you see guys like Calais Campbell, Bud Dupree, David Onyemata respect Grady and what he has done here. Especially because he doesn't have – Aaron Donald type stats. Right. He just doesn't because he's been triple teamed a lot recently. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But but also just that he he's not exact. He's not the he's not a carbon copy of that guy. Mm -hmm. um, so I think to see the league wide respect, he told me, gosh, maybe back in 2021, that what he the the pride that he gets is of course when you have big numbers or you help your team win, but he's had several situations where after the game, the offensive line coach from the other team comes and finds him and says, the week's been hell because of you. Yeah. And that, he said, means as much or more to anything. So the lead, the league-wide respect is there. And he's the public face of this team right now. Yeah. Right now. Maybe Robinson, uh, Bijan Robinson takes it over. Maybe some other uh, offense player does. But who's on the billboards? Mm -hmm. Gradius, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I think that for everyone to kind of pay homage to that is important. And for the Falcons to go out and get him some help is important as well. Also, isn't Calais Campbell like one sack away from 100 sacks in his career? He most certainly is. So do you know who Somebody will get be, a graphic ready. Do you know who will be the most excited if he plays a role in that? Grady Jarrett. 100%. If Grady Jarrett can pull a blocker off of mm -hmm. uh, Calais Campbell and Calais can go sack a quarterback and get number 100... Grady Jarrett will be the first one there to congratulate him. Right. And another kind of side tangential thing, and then we'll get back on script here, is that nobody expected Ryan Nielsen or Arthur Smith after they hired the, their new defensive coordinator to go up and get on the whiteboard and say, this is exactly what we're going to do, and this is exactly what we're going to look like, right? right? I think another thing that we learned is when you look at the New Orleans Saints line where Ryan Nielsen coached them and worked with them for a long time, massive humans everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cam Jordan is – Massive human. Right. Do you know what the Falcons went out and got in free agency? Large. A bunch of massive humans. Bud Dupree and Calais Campbell are just giant individuals. And so I think that we learned that, look, this it's going to be hybrid. It's going to be, you know, all these buzzwords that coaches like to mm -hmm. say when they want to be like super vague yeah. and not really tell you. It's it's going to be a little New Orleans-y. Mm -hmm. And that's not a problem. because New Orleans, New Orleans has had a really, really good defensive front for a very long time. Right. Ryan and Nielsen, David Onyemata. They've played a role in that. Yeah, and I think that that's something else that we learned. If we're just looking at at actions, yeah, right. If we're looking at actions and what they brought in, we're seeing we're going to have some Saints yeah. type style in 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 here, yeah. which is a good thing because the guys they got can execute it. Yep. Um, and Caden Ellis in the middle mm -hmm. can execute it. I think those things are important, and I think that's a good transition to what we learned. Number two is that. The Falcons linebackers can run. They are so fast. I think wow. more than anything, I've I feel like I've spoken on this podcast about this, but the and we've talked at practice about this. I mean, I it's something I've talked to my dad about for forever. Mm -hmm. But the line, the NFL linebacker, how it is transitioned from what it was historically, maybe in the eighties, nineties, early two thousands, where they're just these giant dudes with those neck pads neck braces or whatever like mike singletary yes types, right yes where they are just like these bulldogs that is not the case anymore they are like what is it like a doberman like yeah they are tough and quick and speedy and move very very well maybe a rottweiler i mean mm -hmm. troy anderson isn't like a small guy <laughs> like right and, but he runs a four four yeah. so you're really i think more than anything you are seeing the modern era of linebackers the best example I can give you is Caden Ellis and Troy Anderson right now in the middle of this defense. Is This is what a modern linebacker looks like in the modern NFL era. And how they are utilizing those two I think is really interesting. I'm really curious to see how they work together because this is a position that has kind of fluctuated in three years' time. And there have been a ton of different guys who have had the green dot. So what is this era of 
linebackers at, within Atlanta look like with Caden Ellis and Troy Anderson. And I think you look at them and you know how fast they are. They can go sideline to sideline with the best of them. Arthur Smith said, and I quote, that Troy Anderson can run with just about any running back in the league. And that's saying something, and it's not wrong. And I yeah, think that yeah. because if you look at how the Saints had it, uh, Demario Davis – Big dude. Right. Right. But I, I think you have with Troy Anderson, who we saw come forward and generate pressure a little bit under Dean Pease last year, kind of a little like a like a, a like puppy that's out of control, you know? Wait, I, and I, I mean think, that in the nicest way. Just, I think we said like a golden retriever. Like right. I, I ha- my family has a golden retriever who's like one years old. And I always like think in my head, I'm like, Troy Anderson's really like bogey. Right, which is but, the name of our golden retriever. But, but I also think that that's a positive because 100%. he has the traits to attack and go forward. Yeah. He just has to learn how to do that. But I think that Caden Ellis, seven sacks from the linebacker spot, mm-hmm. he, he can obviously do that. I'm fascinated to see how Ryan Nielsen is going to use Caden Ellis. But I just, as I'm talking through this, as I'm externally processing, yeah, yeah. Uh, that Ryan Nielsen can probably do – the Kate Nellis stuff with, with Troy, Troy Anderson, Anderson. Yeah. And, and vice versa. So with the speed that we've seen, mm-hmm. it's going to allow the defense to do a number of different things. Mm-hmm. Uh, number three, uh, another classic Tori McElhaney uh, thing that she learned. Something about Jesse Bates. That was, Yeah, Scott goes, what do, we, what do we think our third thing is? And I was like, just say something about Jesse Bates. And, and, I, and I think that that's fair yeah. <laughs> because we've seen this kind of incalculable – that's not a word th- – this – hard to define thing about Jesse Bates where mm-hmm. he just he just has so much confidence in the back mm-hmm. he's coordinating things well he's never in the wrong spot yeah he's just one of those guys where he's been in the scheme for like five seconds or something and he just seems to get it mm-hmm. and he's one of those guys where you need a captain in the back mm-hmm. and he is a captain in the back and I think that he's one of those guys look if you go out and you pay that type of money yeah. for a guy who's 26 mm-hmm. Ryan Nielsen talked a lot about not only Jesse Bates, like that dude, but he's been there before. Yeah. So he can help show us the way is another important thing. So you can see that kind of that captaincy from the back already, even at this kind of stage before we even get to training camp. Yeah, something that's really interesting. If you would have told me in February that the Falcons were going to spend the money that they did in free agency on a safety. Uh, safety? I would have told you you're absolutely insane. You're insane. Why would they do that? Like that in like that would have been my thought process. But now here we are in the summer. Jesse Bates has been here for months at this point and I think it's one of the biggest splashes that they could have made and I think it tracks with something that Let's go back even like when Dean Pease was here and and even farther right when Arthur Smith first gets here. And it's like everyone wants to talk about edge rusher, edge rusher, edge rusher in terms of generating a pass rush. They He said, he was like, we have to really build from the inside out. And what did they go and do? They went and got guy, They went and got interior guys, and that includes in the secondary with Jesse Bates. I mean, you think about just a shutdown type of guy. You talk about being in the right place at the right time. That goes towards his just, I think, like football IQ of having the anticipation and the instincts and the knowledge to be where he needs to be to make the play. You saw him do that time and time and time again with Cincinnati. It's why he has the the paycheck that he has right now. And I think like that that shouldn't go overlooked. And I think it's something that if this is February Tory talking and now July or August Tory is kind of like just let this play out because he's he's something I think pretty special, especially when you group him with Jalen Hawkins and Richie Grant, which I'm really curious to see how that rotation kind of morphs out. And then you have him, you know, with AJ Terrell and Jeff Okuda. I mean, just the secondary in general, what he can bring kind of like a trickle down effect because something that Terry Fontenot said right when Jesse Bates first got here was that Jesse Bates is a player that subtly makes everyone around him better right because of things that he does and that i think is the something about jesse bates that we've learned yeah. is that you can already tell he's making everybody else better mm-hmm. to your point just re- and you were kind of a- explaining it about building up the middle building mm-hmm. the fortif- fortifying the, this this defense straight up there are three biggest co- long-term contracts were to defensive tackle yeah. david onyamata 
middle linebacker Caden Ellis and safety Jesse Bates straight up the right. middle. Yeah. And and that's how they're going to build it by having a foundation on the interior that's going to be tough to get through. Mm-hmm. Um which leads us to some of the questions that we have. Yeah. And I'll say this about the questions because Mm -hmm. I don't want anyone to get this misconstrued is when we're saying like the questions that we have of these units, this isn't a bad thing. The fact that we have questions about, hey, how's this going to work out or anything? I don't want this to be taken as, oh, Tori and Scott. They think these guys suck. Yeah, that is not. not I don't want that to be misconstrued because these questions are for us to just kind of have something to look back on when we get to training camp to be like, oh, yeah, we answered that question. We know exactly how this is going to turn out. Right. And I I think that that's fair and appropriate because we're going to talk about a super talented guy in Jeff Okuda Mm -hmm. who had a good year last year and has has had some injury troubles, mm-hmm. yeah. right? They traded for this guy. What they trade for him? A seventh round pick? Mm, yes. Yeah. So uh, right. So anyway, so they so they have him, and we've seen flashes at OTAs and minicamp of him and Drake London going straight up competitive <laughs> yeah. at, at reps mm-hmm. as you can get. And Jeff Okuda makes a play, mm-hmm. right? And you can see the natural talent. Go back and watch his combine workout Gosh, or yeah. Ohio State or even at times last year mm-hmm. when he didn't have a bunch of picks, but his his completion percentage against was pretty low. The pass rating against was 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 pretty low. So, But the, but the question is, what kind of Jeff Okuda are, like, are we going to get? There's mm-hmm. a really good player in there. Yeah. What are we going to see over the course of 17 games? Yeah, and that's, that's a – Big question mark, and I, I know I'm really excited to have Jeff Okuda and, and AJ Terrell working together. I think, I mean, they've known each other for a minute. They've, I mean, they went through the combine process together. They knew each other in college, like being from two powerhouses, Ohio State and Clemson. I mean, and it's just really cool to see these two guys working in tangent with one another on opposite sides of the field. But for Jeff Okuda, and this is something I've brought up before, but The conversations that I've had with Jerry Gray about Jeff Okuda are are very intriguing to me because I think Jerry Gray is really excited to get someone who's just so ready for a fresh start. And and I think that's a good thing. I think sometimes a change of scenery, especially when you go through a coaching change, especially when you go through injuries, sometimes you just need to get into something new. And I feel that with Jeff Okuda when we talk to him and and feeling that he's ready for – Whatever it is that comes next. And I and that's the thing. When I say whatever it is that comes next, we don't know. Like, w- we're talking about, like, wh- who, what Jeff Okuda are we going to see out there in 2023 for the Falcons? We don't know. And But I know that Jerry – I can tell you what Jerry Gray wants to see. Jerry Gray wants to see the confident guy that came from Ohio State. That's what he wants to see. He wants to see the guy who came into the league at the top and, and felt it and was confident. And, and then the injuries happen, and it kind of brings – brings it down, he wants to get back up. He wants to get him back up where his confidence is. And I, I think that's something that goes overlooked with cornerbacks in general. The, the More than almost any other position on the field, I feel like cornerbacks have to have this like very confident mindset because of how much they're on an island with these really talented receivers. And the fact that they're going to fail. Yeah, and, and you're going to – like they're going to get burned – Mm-hmm. You know, like, and the, but they're also going to do some burning. So I, I, I think that, like, when you're Jerry Gray, you're wanting, you're wanting to get Jeff Okuda to b- buy into himself again. Mm-hmm. And I think that is where, where we are. Can he do that? Mm-hmm. Can, can he get to that point? If we're five weeks into the season, are we seeing a really, really confident Jeff Okuda that's going out there and just playing with a lot of swag? Like, yeah, I, and absolutely. I, I, you hope that. If you're Jerry Gray, if you're the Falcons, if you're Jeff Okuda. But we don't know. We're not there yet. Right. But it, And this is a small sample size. But when you get the fresh start, the weight of being the number three overall pick mm-hmm. goes away a little bit. It right? Does. It's not just always there yeah. all the time. And Good, the fact bad, that you have different. AJ Terrell on the other side of you who right. – Everybody, I think we he's can, a number one. He's an, Come on. yeah, and I, I think like you, you look at what he did in twenty one and even twenty two. I mean, I know he was hurt for a little mm-hmm. bit, but like this is a guy who quarterbacks are well aware of where where Grady Jarrett is on the field and where AJ Terrell is on the field, and and we saw that in twenty one just because his targets were so mm-hmm. low, guys were just not throwing his direction. So when you have that guy opposite you, kind of takes a load off, and you can just be like. 
all right, I'm going to go play my game. Mm -hmm. I know he's got it on the other side of the field. I'll, I'll do what I can. Right. And so let's stick with the cornerbacks here moving into the slot. Yeah. I don't know how many quote unquote true position battles there are for starting spots. Mm -hmm. There were a lot more last year and the, and the year before slot cornerback, I think is one, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. you've got Mike Hughes who they signed mm -hmm. to a two year two deal. Year he can play in the slot. The, the Falcons are very confident in that mm -hmm. as another guy that Jerry guy, Jerry Gray really likes mm -hmm. uh, D Alford who you've been asking a lot of questions about because <laughs> he's had a really good spring. He has that, that there are some options in the slot and it will be interesting to see how that one plays out, but we still don't know. We don't know. I'm really excited about seeing what happens between D. Alford and, and Mike Hughes. They have very, very different like journeys to where they are. Mike Hughes was a first round draft pick. D. Alford had to kind of work his way up from XFL, right? Or CFL. 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 Yeah. I'm so sorry. CFL works his way up from the CFL. I mean, two completely different stories. And they're now here in Atlanta battling it out for honestly two very two different roles because now that unfortunately Avery Williams is out for the year with an ACL injury, the Falcons are looking for their next punt returner. You want to know who's competing for that? D. Alford and Mac, my, Mike Hughes. Right. Like they're competing for that. They're also competing at nickel. I'm so curious to see how that dynamic plays out in training camp because I think that. You're exactly right. There aren't a lot of spots open. This is one, and this is the most, what I believe to be the most heated battle of training camp, and I'm really excited to see it because both guys are coming at it from very, very different, like, angles in terms of a storyline. Yeah. And and I just, I, I get kind of giddy about it because you just love seeing this kind of thing. Yeah, because it's D. Alfred, a, a CFL guy from a small college mm -hmm. trying to prove himself and earn that spot mm -hmm. that, that uh, you know, against all odds. Mm -hmm. And then you have a former first round pick in Mike Hughes, who's finally healthy and in right. a good system. That, Similarly to Jeff Okuda. Right. And he's trying to come in and, and, and prove himself. So mm -hmm. two very different storylines. Mm -hmm. uh, one very important position, even if he's not a quote unquote starter. Um, the group that we haven't talked that much about are the second-year uh, defenders and how they fit. We've, we've talked a lot about this defensive front. We're talking about Grady Jarrett and a lot of new guys. Yeah, Arnold Ebicady, mm -hmm. still around. Yeah, D'Angelo Malone, still involved here. Mm -hmm. Trey Anderson, we can can he be that three-down guy? So mm -hmm. let's maybe focus on those edge guys, right? Yeah. For as much as it's a big defensive front, there is a jack linebacker spot, mm -hmm. a, what, as Arthur Smith says, like whatever the gurus want to call <laughs> whatever it. Whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Right. But nonetheless, there is that kind of – it's not always even weak side edge rusher, but like there's that edge rusher right. and where – and that Lorenzo Carter seems to be the guy mm -hmm. for that spot. Where do you see Arnold Epicady fitting in? This is a second-round pick. Mm -hmm. And uh, D'Angelo, this is like this is a third-round pick. They've been cross-training a bit. Mm -hmm. Question mark is how do they fit in? Right uh, to this defense with so many new pieces. Yeah, and I think we'll find out more when we do get into like putting the pads on and actually going a little bit more live and getting into joint practices and actually seeing a rotation with this front seven. I think we'll be able to answer that question in a little bit. That's why it's on here. It's uh -huh. like we will get to that point where we can answer this question. But I think just right now, after OTAs and after minicamp, I thought it was really interesting that there were a few times where it's like Bud Dupree – Lorenzo Carter, Grady, and David Onyemata in the middle, and then AK just kind of like roaming a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a really interesting group. And then AK comes off, and like D. Alfred comes in for a nickel package, and then the the twos go come on, and it's like D'Angelo Malone also kind of roaming around a little bit. I and D'Angelo Malone, I think, is somebody who I went into this after Ryan Nielsen was hired, and I was like, I don't know where he fits. Where he fits. Yeah. I just don't because he. You talk about hybrid players. He he is one of those type of guys mm -hmm. through and through. And I was like, I just don't know where he's going to fit. Even like AK, I don't know exactly what role he's going to play. We're kind of starting to see that they are they are still playing a little bit of a hybrid role. And you talk about that Jack like mm -hmm. linebacker type of role. D'Angelo Malone was doing quite a bit of that in OTAs and mini camp. And I'm excited to see more of what Ryan Nielsen is going to do with those two guys in terms of leaning into their skill set because it's they're not their skill set is not the same as Bud Dupree. It's not that really the same as Lorenzo Carter. They they are different guys and I know that Arnold Abicati you put you, he's a second round pick. They draft they went up in the second round to get him. So 
you're not just you're not going to not put him out there so how do you lean into what his strength is and what happens when you do put bud dupree and lorenzo carter out there and you have ak just kind of like roaming around he said he left some money out on the field in 2020 2022 Mm -hmm. this is a guy who wants (laughs) wants that bank he wants to go out in 23 and and prove that he can go and get that money and the money we're talking about is sacks Mm -hmm. um so how how do you put him the best position to be that that's a question mark yeah and i think that's what good coaches do i think some of them come in and they say well he that's not the body type for my system i wasn't around when they drafted him see ya but it seems like that they're really trying to get creative with how they want to use this and how they can create pressure um so it's going to be fascinating to see uh, a really intriguing defense kind of come together and build chemistry and morph over the course of the summer so that's going to wrap it up for part two of our i guess i called it summer school edition of falcons final whistle thank you guys so much for joining us hope you guys are listening on a you know, White Sand Beach or something like that. That's where Tori and I are going to be. Uh, I'm sure. <laughs> and anyway, thank you guys so much. And we were going to, and we will be checking in with you quite often on Falcons Final Whistle throughout the course of training camp. So please rate, review, and subscribe uh, so you are getting all that content brought right to you. Thank you so much. And we will talk to you again real, real soon. See ya.